Law, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to the 35th annual Jeff Jefferson B. Fordham debate. Uh, the Fordham debate was actually conceived of first by our students. And I mention that because there's a lot of talk um, in legal education these days about teaching law students to be innovative and entrepreneurial. And I just want to brag and say that our students were three and a half decades ahead of that curve um, in being innovative. The debate honors our very esteemed former uh, colleague, Jefferson Fordham. Uh, he actually was not our dean. He was the dean of um, Ohio State Law School and then the University uh, uh, Rennell is uh, beaming because that's her alma mater. Uh, Ohio State Law School and, um, and the University of Pennsylvania Law School for 23 years, um, a record that I think none of the three deans here can imagine, 30, 23 years um, as dean. And then to Utah's great fortune, he came here to teach for another two decades and taught until the ripe old age of 88. So he was teaching and inspiring our students well into his ninth decade. So I have this wonderful collection of tributes to Dean Fordham that were published in the 10th, um, edition, uh, 10th anniversary edition of our former Journal of Contemporary Law. And what's great about those quotes is that every year I find several quotes that are perfect for the debate topic of the evening. And this year was no exception. So I have three quotes. One is from Justice William Brennan, who wrote of Dean Fordham, the meaning of constitutional liberty for all of us has been singularly enriched by his unflagging efforts to bring home to all Americans the precious values of the constitutional guarantee of individual rights and responsibilities. And in my view, uh, free speech is a right which also entails responsibilities. Our former dean, Sam Thurman, wrote, Jeff has never been hesitant to take public positions on matters of moment, even when those positions were not contemporaneously popular. Free speech applies to ideas that are both popular and unpopular. And our former colleague, Professor John Flynn, wrote, he is an unabashed liberal and a real conservative, open to all ideas and deeply reflective. So uh, we should embrace not only freedom of speech, but freedom to listen and freedom to reflect on and consider all ideas. In Dean Fordham's own words, we must not let great problems of our times concerned with the first order of human values pass us by. We continue to address the great um, issues concerning human values of our times in the Fordham debate. This is no exception um, with our focus on free speech on campus. Um, and I want to thank all of those who made this evening possible. First, our funders uh, through the generosity of Jeff Fordham's widow, Rita Fordham. Uh, this is funded by the Fordham Endowment, but also by funding from the um, SJ and Jesse E. Quinney Foundation, our namesake. Uh, funders. I want to thank our spectacular events team and IT staff and development and media staff for organizing and publicizing the debate. I want to give my preliminary welcome to our two uh, special guests this evening. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. Um, Professor Jones will give them their formal welcome. And I want to add my very special thanks to uh, Professor Rennell Anderson-Jones, our own expert in the First Amendment. She is also our Programs Committee Chair uh, this year. She thought of this debate topic. She organized uh, the debate. She will formally introduce our speakers, uh, introduce the topic, um, and explain how it will operate. Please help me welcome Professor Jones. Thank you, uh, Dean Adler. <clears throat> uh, to say that I am thrilled to be hosting our two debaters for the evening would be a pretty staggering understatement. Um, the topic for this evening could not be more timely or important, and uh, you are more fortunate than you can ever know uh, to have two of the nation's brightest First Amendment stars here to discuss this topic and its really complicated contours. 
Recent headlines have drawn attention to free speech controversies at university campuses all across the country. We've seen some pretty high profile incidents of invited speakers who faced and sometimes were even shut down by uh, protesters. Uh, Milo Yiannopoulos, uh, Ben Shapiro, some other conservative commentators, the shouting down of author Charles Murray at Middlebury College last year in a phenomenon sometimes referred to as no platforming. And campus speech, of course, involves much more than speech by invited guest speakers who are controversial. Speech, uh, both of the productive, useful sort and of the offensive, problematic sort, however that might be defined, can happen in classrooms, faculty offices, common areas, shared university spaces. And some of these other campus settings, uh, too, have been cause for uh, commentators to suggest that speech codes and other regulations increasingly incentivize administrators to limit expression. There's some pretty standard catchphrases that get thrown around in uh, public conversations about these issues. Critics charge, for example, that we're wrongly transforming campuses into so-called safe spaces where offensive speech is banned and political correctness is enforced. These folks argue that universities are instead supposed to be places where you confront squarely um, unfamiliar and challenging ideas. From this vantage point comes the constitutional argument that a core part of a university's educational mission is to facilitate the education of future leaders in a democracy. And thus, First Amendment free speech principles are essential in resolving these sorts of campus speech disputes. In this view, when campus speakers face censorship uh, from uh, university authorities or calls for censorship um, from the public, it is a squarely a First Amendment issue. Others, including our affirmative debater for the evening, Professor Post, have pushed back against this increasingly frequent claim that universities are suppressing First Amendment rights of students, faculty, and invited speakers arguing that instead this claim rests on a fundamental misconception of the nature of First Amendment rights, which they argue do not apply to campuses, but instead were designed to apply to public discourse and to establish the preconditions for democratic self-governance. Debates about the proper balance of values in the regulation of campus speech in this view are ultimately just debates about the nature of education and not about First Amendment rights. There are dangers, the argument goes, in trying to map the language and structure of First Amendment rights into the complex and subtle processes that make education possible. Because what members of the university community enjoy in this view is not First Amendment freedom of speech, but rather academic freedom, which does not in fact always entail an equality of ideas. Now these issues are really difficult ones and they matter immensely. They're central to the experience that we provide for students, those who wish to speak, those who wish to hear controversial speakers, and those who are victimized by speech. They are at the core of difficult administrative decisions that we have to make on campuses like this one, and they are important to our wider society because campus speech controversies very often foreshadow or channel larger cultural disputes and larger societal tensions. From all of this emerges our resolution for tonight's debaters. Be it resolved that the First Amendment rights of members of university communities may be constrained when their speech undermines the educational or research missions of the university. Professor Post will argue in the affirmative and Dean Lidsky in the negative. Let me introduce you more formally to the two debaters who will help us uh, tussle with these tensions this evening and then I'll give you a sense of the format before we dive in. Professor Post is the Sterling Professor of Law and former Dean at Yale Law School. Before coming to Yale, he taught at the University of California at Berkeley School of Law. A nationally renowned expert in constitutional law, First Amendment, legal history, and equal protection, he has written and edited numerous books, including Citizens Divided, A Constitutional Theory of Campaign Finance Reform, Democracy Expertise and Academic Freedom, A First Amendment Jurisprudence for the Modern State, and for the common good, principles of American academic freedom. He publishes regularly in the nation's top legal journals and other publications. He is a member of the American Philosophical Society and the American Law Institute, a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and a former member of the board of directors of the American Constitution Society. 
Professor Post's book chapter, which is titled The Classic First Amendment Tradition Under Stress, Freedom of Speech and the University, is part of a larger edited volume that's due out in, I think, just a couple of weeks. And it has become something of a centerpiece on this national debate on campus speech and its intersection with First Amendment values, which is our focus for tonight. So please join me in welcoming Professor Robert Post. Let me also introduce Dean Larissa Litsky, who is the Judge C.A. Leedy Professor of Law at the University of Missouri School of Law, where she has also served as Dean since July of 2017. Previously, she was Associate Dean and Stephen C. O'Connell Professor and Chair in Law at the University of Florida, where she received numerous teaching and research awards during her 23 years on the faculty. She was also a Fulbright Scholar at Cambridge University. Dean Litsky's scholarship focuses on torts, especially defamation and related speech torts, and on some very timely First Amendment issues, including free speech issues arising in the social media context, where she's become arguably the nation's foremost legal expert on the topic. She is the co-author of several casebooks, including a First Amendment casebook and a leading media law casebook, and has published dozens of other works in top law reviews. Dean Litsky's important work on anonymous speech has been cited by a number of state Supreme Courts and the highest courts of several countries. She has a fascinating forthcoming California Law Review article that actually contains an emoji right in the title. Uh, hashtag I gun emoji you, uh, considering the context of online threats. We're so fortunate uh, to have her with us here tonight. Welcome, Dean Litsky. Okay, so our Fordham debates follow a fixed debate format. First, Professor Post will speak in the affirmative for 15 minutes. Then Dean Lidsky speaks in opposition uh, for 15 minutes. Professor Post then speaks for five minutes in rebuttal, and Dean Lidsky has five minutes for sir rebuttal. And finally, uh, both debaters have five minutes in which to make additional points and offer up some concluding arguments. Our uh, 35 years of Fordham debates here at the law school have been focused on creating community dialogue and conversation and learning. And in this spirit, we don't uh, score the debate or declare a winner. And further in this spirit, we reserve approximately 30 minutes for you all to become a part of the conversation uh, uh, for audience Q&A. Uh, let me remind you all that we will be using the Slido app tonight to curate and organize your questions for the Q&A portion of the program. Uh, the information that uh, we're going to display it on the screen, Sam, is that maybe, oh, is it there already? Oh, it is there. Great, there's the code. Okay. <laughs> Um, this gives you the details of the, of the code. Um, what you do is you download the Slido app, if you've not done so at, our pre at one of our previous events, and then you enter in the event code that's listed there, E648. Uh, once you've done so, you'll easily be able to answer potential questions to the queue, both during the debate itself, while it's ongoing, and in the conversation time after it continues. Um, I have um, access here to all of the questions that will be submitted. Uh, you can vote on them. Um, if, you, uh, if you think those are a good question and you, uh, you see them on the app and you would like them to be moved up to the top of the queue, you can also um, chime in in that way. And we will, um, in this way, be able to sort for the most relevant and the most popular questions so that we can get the very most out of our time together. Uh, those of you who prefer not to use the app or who don't um, have with you a smartphone or other device uh, to use for submitting questions are welcome to submit your questions with Lori. Uh, raise your hand. There she is. <laughs> um, she'll be available right over there throughout the debate and during the Q&A uh, to enter your submitted questions. With that, uh, we'll turn the time to Professor Post for his affirmative argument. Thank you so much. And thank you to Bob and to Ronell. Um, for the invitation to be in this gorgeous building in this gorgeous city. I have very uh, warm feelings about this law school. When I was uh, a lawyer, I used to be a First Amendment lawyer, and I used to practice with Scott Matheson, who was uh, one of your former deans. So um, I, I want to um, clear a little uh, brush out of the way um, as we consider the resolution for tonight. The resolution says, be it resolved that the First Amendment rights of members of, a university, of university communities may be constrained when their speech undermines the educational research missions of the university. So first, um, the first point I want to make is many universities, as you know, are not subject to the First Amendment. Um, they're private universities, and you need state action before there's any First Amendment rights. And I want to put that to one side. Let's act as if all universities, for the moment, are subject to the restrictions of the First Amendment, just 
just to put that out to one side. But the second point I want to make is, of course, if the First Amendment does apply, universities must comply with the First Amendment, and we're not here to debate whether or not universities should engage in civil disobedience. So with that thought in mind, I want to interpret First Amendment rights here in a metaphorical way. The question of what we mean by the First Amendment's constraining universities um, has to do with what most people understand First Amendment rights to be. They understand the rights they have against state regulation if they were speaking in a public space, if they were handing out leaflets or publishing a newspaper or or um, publishing a blog, something like that. And so when we say the First Amendment rights of members of the community can be constrained, what we mean are the rights that someone would have were they to be engaging in those kinds of activities, standing in a park and, and speaking on a soapbox, that sort of thing. So what are those rights? We need to know what those rights are before we know whether they can be constrained. And uh, the First Amendment doctrine, if any of you out there have studied it, is unbearably complex. Indeed, one major scholar of the First Amendment has said it's like the tax code. There's so many provisions and so many contradictory uh, injunctions. But I'm just going to reduce it all um, to three major, uh, three major principles. Um, it's fair to say, if these principles don't apply, we're not really talking about the First Amendment that people have in mind. So the first principle is the state cannot engage in viewpoint or content discrimination. It can't say, you can talk about this, but you can't talk about that. Or you can take this point of view, but not that point of view. That's a no-no. State, when you, when you are speaking, the state can't regulate your speech by engaging in content discrimination or viewpoint discrimination. Second point, most people imagine that as part of their First Amendment rights. Uh, second point, the state um, cannot force you to speak. It can't compel you to speak if you don't want to speak. So the right to, you can say what you want. The state can't engage in content discrimination. And if what you want to say is nothing, because you want to be silent, the state can not say, you have to talk. That's the second rule. And the third rule um, is, I, um, as the court has put it, there's no such thing as a false idea for purposes of the First Amendment. And another way the court has put this in a case called Mosley is there's an equality of, of status for ideas in the realm of the First Amendment. All ideas are equal. There, there's, uh, you can't, um, uh, you can't uh, intervene and say this idea is better than that idea to regulate a speaker. So those three rules give you a rough idea of what people imagine when they say my First Amendment rights. And it will be the kind of rights that I'll be talking about when I argue in the affirmative that these kinds of rights can be and are in fact always constrained in the university setting. So um, the first point to make about those rights is that they're extremely um, uh, rigorous. Uh, how many uh, situations are you in where um, you, you're, the truth of your speech can't be regulated and all ideas are equal? Just to, give you a, just to give you a concrete situation, you go to your doctor and uh, your doctor misdiagnoses your cancer and so you don't get treated and you're harmed and you sue the doctor for the doctor's diagnosis. Um, does the doctor get to say no content discrimination when you sue the doctor for malpractice? Does the doctor get to say, well, I didn't have to say anything. You can't compel me to speak. Does the doctor get to say all ideas are equal when I say you have cancer? It's equal to saying you have a heart condition? No. Um, that doesn't happen when you go to a professional, when in most of the situations in your life where there's any form of regulation, this isn't that. Um, the, in particular, uh, there are, whenever the government creates an institution that's dedicated to the accomplishment of a purpose, we regulate speech within those institutions in order to accomplish the purposes of the institution. So take a simple institution that you're all familiar with, a courtroom. If you go into a courtroom and you make an argument and the court rules that out of bounds, he's engaged, the court is engaged in content discrimination. If the court says to the defense lawyer, you can't, you can't say your client is guilty, all ideas aren't equal with respect to the defense lawyer. If the court says to the, lawyer, to the defendant, you have to plead one way or the other, the defendant can't say no compelled speech. 
We regulate speech all the time in ways which violate these rules in an institution like a court. Why? Because a court exists to promote justice, and the court has to regulate the behavior of people in the courtroom, including their speech, in ways that promote justice. And the rules of evidence are all rules that violate these three First Amendment principles, and yet they're perfectly constitutional. Universities are no different than that. Universities exist for a particular reason. They exist to educate students, to bring them uh, into maturity, to, uh, make them, to make students think for themselves. And so let's take a simple situation like a classroom. Um, if, I, uh, if the students are in my classroom and uh, they start talking, I say, quiet down, class is starting. I stop speech altogether until we're ready to begin class. Like, you're silent. If you were all standing talking, we couldn't have had um, this debate. Do I engage in content discrimination? Of course I do, all the time. We're studying First Amendment now. We're not studying basketball. And it's inappropriate to be talking about the World Series if we're studying um, the Constitution. Are all ideas equal for my student? Of course not. We call that grades. It's my job to say which ideas are better and which ideas are worse. That's my job, is to teach students how to think better. And students expect to be evaluated on the quality of their ideas. So if we had the principle that all ideas were equal, uh, there would be no grades. Everyone could say what they want. But the classroom is not a marketplace of ideas where um, the students who talk the most are the best. That just happens not to be true. Um, is there, can I compel my students to speak? Yes, I call on them. I say, answer the question, it's called examinations. You have to speak up. Um, and none of these rules apply in the classroom. What about my role as a professor, you know, who, has, who gets evaluated on my uh, research? Um, well, is there content discrimination? Yes, universities hire in fields they think are productive and not in fields they don't. They give grants when they think research will be productive and not when and, and they don't when they think the research is uh, going nowhere. Is there, are all ideas equal for my research? No, that's called tenure. They evaluate the quality of my work and they decide is it good work, is it bad work? That's what universities do. Um, can I be compelled to speak? You know, you, I think you know what that's called. That's called publish or perish. You know, it's a very uncomfortable situation, but it's intrinsic to the job. Now, that's not to say that there's no freedom in a university. There's a lot of freedom in a university, but it tend, it's, it's better subsumed under the rubric of academic freedom. Academic freedom is the freedom to pursue your job understood in terms of the mission of the university. So I have the freedom to research in ways that promote research and students have the freedom to be a student in a way that promotes um, education. It's a functional kind of freedom. It's defined in terms of the mission of the university, not in terms of these three principles of First Amendment um, that I've described to you. Um, and at root, academic freedom is not an individual freedom at all. It's a freedom of the of the academic profession to pursue the profession in a way that's free from the influence of uh, large donors or uh, lay trustees or academic administrators because it's the academic profession that needs to be self-regulated. That's the meaning of academic freedom. And to get a, 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 a sharp understanding of the difference between a right that's an individual right, like freedom of speech is my individual right, and a right that's a professional right, a right of a profession like academic freedom, take the following example. A young man doesn't get tenure at a university and he thinks the judgment was terrible and infected with bias and he sues the university to be tenured. And um, a judge is hearing the case. What's a judge to do? How is a judge going to know whether the young professor's work merits tenure or not? The only way that the judge is going to do that is to call experts in the field. And the judge is going to make a judgment about the quality of the young professor's work within the field. And if the work meets the standards of the field, the judge might say university is making a judgment, the wrong kind of judgment. And if the young man's work doesn't meet the standards of the profession, then the court will find against the young professor. So what is that telling you? The judge is upholding the standards of the field, not the individual right of the professor to say whatever he or she wants to say. It's not an individual right. It's the standards of the profession which are being upheld. 
So where do these three First Amendment rules that I've talked about come from? Why do we have such rules in the first place? The answer is First Amendment rights developed in the 1930s um, in order to promote, uh, as the court said in Stromberg, uh, a republic in which the government will be responsive to the people. So we have freedom of speech so that we can speak and form public opinion, and the state can be responsive to public opinion. This is an extremely precious right. It means we govern ourselves in this country. We don't govern ourselves merely by a vote. We govern ourselves by persuading each other how to vote. That's the key point. The First Amendment is a form of self-government that's ongoing, continuous, and the right of every single one of us, whether or not we vote. And these three rules protect essential aspects of self-governance. We are, when we govern ourselves, we are sovereign. And so we set the agenda for the government. The government doesn't set the agenda for us. That's what the rule against content discrimination is about. When we govern ourselves, there are no experts in self-governance. A philosopher like John Rawls has no more expertise to tell us what's right and wrong than I do, than you do, than anybody does, because, because the democracy is responsible to all of us, each of us equally as citizens. So all ideas aren't equal, speaking epistemologically. That's what we train universities to do, to, to have, and that's what universities train students to do, to distinguish better from worse ideas epistemologically, which are more likely to be true, which are better, which are worse. But all citizens are, have the equal right to have an idea. And it's that political equality that the equality of ideas in First Amendment doctrine is about. And the third rule, the state can't force me to speak, if the function of First Amendment doctrine is to make the state, is to make me believe that the state is potentially responsive to me. We call that democratic legitimation. The state is democratically legitimate with respect to me because I can make the state responsive to me. All I have to do is persuade other people. If that's the point of First Amendment rules, and I think it is, I think we can show that it is in many ways, um, then if the state is making me say things I don't want to say, it's not responsive to me anymore. It violates the essential premise of making the state democratically responsive if the state is making me say things I don't want to say. So you can see how these three rules are extremely important. They correspond to the sovereignty of sovereign citizenship. And insofar as we act as citizens, we are sovereign in the way that those rules protect. But when I'm a teacher, I'm a teacher, and I'm doing the things in my role as teacher. And when one is a student, one is, a, one is uh, not exercising the sovereign prerogatives of self-government, one is learning. So that's the case for why the state, does, the state universities can and do regulate speech all the time that interferes with the university mission. Thank you. Uh, 15 minutes for uh, Dean Litsky. Okay. Thank you. It is a true honor to be here, uh, sitting here with two of my scholarly heroes. When I was in law school and was considering a, going into academia, one of the reasons I decided to become a defamation law scholar was because of the path-breaking work of Dean Post. And Professor Anderson Jones is one of the absolute foremost First Amendment law scholars in the country, and particularly in the realm of press freedom. And I think I may have read almost every word she's ever written, and so it is an honor tonight to be here. I'd like to begin with an initial caveat, uh, and, I, and I think this, this caveat is a little bit of what Dean Post is trying to correct. People often mistake what good policy demands with what the First Amendment demands. The First Amendment dictates what state actors, such as public universities, may not do but it does not say what they ought to do. And sometimes these things get blurred, and I will be talking a bit about both, but I'll try to keep them uh, somewhat distinct. So my central point tonight is that there is partial truth in the statement that universities can constrain the speech of people on their campus to serve educational and research purposes, but it's a misleading oversimplification to say that the First Amendment rights of all speakers on campus may be constrained for educational purposes simply because of where they are speaking. Uh, moreover, it's also a bad idea. Now that's true for at least three reasons. Okay, for First Amendment purposes, it's important to note that there's 
No such thing as campus speech. That's not a legal category. Instead, on campuses, there are a great variety of contexts in which people may be speaking, and all of those contexts are subject to different kinds of First Amendment principles. So when Dean Post says you can't, you can't reduce all campus speech to three major principles, of course that is true. Different First Amendment principles apply differently if you were talking about classrooms, if you were talking about dorm rooms, or if you were talking about offices, or the broad swaths of public space that exist on most public university campuses, including public streets that run through those campuses. So uh, it's, what matters for First Amendment purposes for analysis of the, the relative spe free speech rights and how they balance against other state interests, other public university interests, includes where, a camp where on a campus a speaker is speaking, who the speaker is, why she's speaking, when she's speaking, and how she's speaking. So that's a little abstract. Let me give you some examples. A faculty member may be speaking in her role as a public employee when she's in a faculty meeting, okay? Or she might be speaking in her role as a scholar, in which case she would be constrained, by, or in which case she would be protected by academic freedom. She might be speaking as a scholar when she's publishing her research. Uh, she might be speaking as a citizen when she's on the university quad, or perhaps in an email to colleagues. So context really matters uh, here in analyzing what the rights of that faculty member or a staff person are on uni in university spaces. The same is true for students. A student may be speaking as a pupil in the classroom who may be censored for straying off topic. The student may be a customer in the campus gym, uh, a tenant in the dorm room, or she may be speaking in a citizen in the speaker's circle on campus. I'm very proud that on my campus at the University of Missouri-Columbia that the speaker's circle is directly behind the law school, uh, which, I, which I fully support. I don't support it as much when they're out there with loudspeakers during exam time, which that can be restricted, but that's a story for, for another moment. Uh, I've had to walk out with my associate dean to tell him to tone it down. So. Um, but for First Amendment purposes, all of these variables matter. It matters whether a student is speaking or whether she's screaming. It matters whether she's speaking loudly at night or at noon, waving a protest sign, posting on Instagram, or perhaps camping on a t in a tent on the quad, uh, allegedly for expressive purposes. Invited speakers uh, raise, invited and disinvited speakers, I should say, raise some of the most difficult issues, uh, but students may have a right to receive information on campuses from a diversity, di diversity of viewpoints, at least in some campus areas. Uh, so uh, no one size First Amendment principle fits all in these multiple spaces on campus, and the classroom is probably the easiest example where the maximum deference will be given to the state to enforce educational purposes, but the answer is quite different in spaces like speeches, uh, speaker's circle. Which leads me to my second point. As the philosopher John Dewey once said, an important mission of a public university, of public universities, is to enable students to become citizens capable of democratic self-governance. Um, so, I believe as a policy obligation, clearly, public universities owe it to their students and owe it to society to dedicate certain public spaces to hearing a variety of viewpoints, not subject to constraints by a, an administrator's decision that, the, that it's educational, that it passes the test of educational. Uh, on many campuses today, including here at the University of Utah and at my home institution at the University of Missouri in Columbia, uh, we have statutes that demand that those public spaces be treated as public forums in which public universities should not be censoring speakers for their content or their viewpoint. 
they can only censor them to put in place reasonable time, place, and manner restrictions, like that loudspeaker issue I, I mentioned. Um, I would contend, although this is more arguable, I would contend that a, a, an interpretation of First Amendment principles suggests that those public spaces ought to be treated as public forums as well. And there's a precedent on point back from uh, Healy versus James dealing with campus free speech in which Justice Powell specifically suggested that campuses should be peculiar, pe peculiarly market places of ideas. Now that statement itself was overbroad, but nonetheless, state universities in particular must model the way we speak to each other as citizens in society. Okay, I now come to my third point, and um, that is that deference to university officials' judgments about educational purposes should not be confused with judicial abdication of responsibility to safeguard First Amendment values. From both a policy and a First Amendment standpoint, a university may become a threat to free thought and free speech when it attempts to impose ideological conformity in the guise of imposing pedagogical norms or policing professional expertise. And there are historical examples of this. So for example, during the McCarthy era, uh, there were campuses that rooted out the, the supposed or actual communists in their ranks on the grounds that they couldn't be capable of effective teaching, they couldn't be uh, serving educational purposes because they were communist. Uh, during the Vietnam War and the Civil Rights era, there were campuses that uh, policed students because, for example, they joined uh, groups like the, uh, what's it called, the SDS, the, Social Demo the Society of Democratic Socialists. So because uh, they were a threat to order on campus and they were a threat to the, to the campus uh, fulfilling, fulfilling its educational mission. So the elephant in the room here, I think, that's worth noting, or I really should say the elephant not in the room, is that campuses uh, are, there are, there aren't many studies on this that have good objective evidence, but I've been on, but there's one that, uh, there's one and I've been on university campuses my whole life. Particularly in the social sciences, there are many more liberal professors than there are conservative professors. So in one study, it was a ratio of more, to, more than 10 to 1 in the social sciences. And you'll note that some of the examples that Dean Post gave were not in the social sciences where educational purposes, uh, you know, in the, in the hard sciences, it may be easier to tell if a professor is serving educational purposes or not educational purposes. Uh, but in the social sciences, those are more contested and more subject to um, potential groupthink and ideological conformity. So I think that's a significant underpinning to what's going on in some of the free speech controversies. And some of the examples of how those controversies play out uh, definitely, definitely kind of conform to this narrative. Um, so for example, Laura Kipnis, a professor on the campus at Northwestern, uh, wrote an article claiming or asserting that Title IX enforcement, enforcement of, of uh, harassment on campus, was overly broad and was intruding on the realm of, of free speech. And a student reported her for harassment for writing that article. Now, you can say she should just be protected by academic freedom, but it, it, there's also an argument that she should be uh, protected by ordinary First Amendment principles as well, but the fact that there was an ongoing investigation that didn't terminate until she wrote about the kind of Kafka-esque procedure she was subjected to um, tends to suggest that 
the ideological group think I've, de I've described was a feature in that free speech controversy. Uh, there's, there's more examples. Not all of the examples cut to one side of the political spectrum or another, uh, but there's certainly more examples where the dominance of people from a certain ideological perspective on campuses might lead them to think that something is an educational purpose when really uh, they're, they're not policing pedagogy, they're policing politics. And so I think it's very important to recognize that in the free speech controversy today, that that is one of the undercurrents. There's another, in my rebuttal, I hope to speak about a, another a threat from the other side uh, but uh, nonetheless, my final point is that in saying that we have to defer to public universities on the grounds of educational purposes, we really need to be careful to distinguish between education and indoctrination, and courts applying First Amendment principles have a very important role in that, in that distinction. Thank you to both of you. Okay, uh, we will now have five minutes uh, for rebuttal uh, and then uh, five additional minutes for Sir Rebuttal. So it's such a pleasure to be here and listen to Larissa. It's a great, great occasion and wonderful points. And I totally agree, of course, we want to distinguish indoctrination from education, but it's unclear to me how First Amendment rights do that as opposed to a theory of what education is. So we need a theory of education to make precisely the distinction, I think, that you properly put before us. And I, I also agree with Larissa. She's quite right that context is going to matter, um, how one regulates communication on a campus. That has to be true. Now, the question is, um, how does context matter? With respect to what does context matter? And here we start with a principle that universities are institutions designed to either advance knowledge or to educate. And any penny that they spend that's not for these purposes is a frolic and a detour. You know, they're wasting taxpayer money if they're just spending it because they want to spend it on something. So they have to give educational justifications for any time they spend resources, and that includes resources on outside speakers, for example. So why does a university invite outside speakers? Because it's educational. No one has a right to come to a university and speak. It's not a park. They can't just come into a university and, and erect a soapbox, unless you say it is. And then, of course, you can say it isn't. It's up to you to say whether it is or whether it isn't. The fact that the public can come on campus doesn't make it a public forum. We know that. It's the university's decision to control its spaces as it controls. Um, universities typically give money to student organizations or resources to student organizations and say, invite whom you wish. That's the university's decision to delegate the question of who is, will be an educational speaker for the university. Um, there's policies behind that. One of them, I quite agree with what Larissa was said about Dewey, to teach students how to exercise the prerogatives of citizenship. And so delegating these decisions can have important educational benefits. But just as they can have important educational benefits, um, they can have important educational detriments too. So two points about that one is you didn't have to make the decision as a university to allow students to have off, off site, uh, to invite outside speakers. That's an educational decision. And everything that follows from that is an educational decision and has to be um, measured against the educational impact on the university. Maybe not speaker by speaker, maybe it raises the threshold speaker by speaker, but certainly at the level of programming that you create the limited public forum of student organizations being able to invite speakers. So that's, that's the first point. Second point, when we come to students, um, the ability, the authority of the university to regulate students as students rather than as citizens depends on the relationship of the student speech to the university. Um, and Larissa puts that on the day, absolutely correct. So imagine a student group on a campus which is going out and demonstrating against the women's house and saying unspeakable things in Utah. We speak them in New Haven, unfortunately. Um, but unspeakable things. Can they uh, that make it make the lives of women in the in the women's house intolerable? Of course, they can regulate them because they deny the right to education to the right. That's the wrong word. They uh, they deny educational opportunities to other students on the campus. It's inconsistent with the campus to have students yelling at each other in that way. Can the university regulate it? Of course, it can because its job is to educate all those students. Could 
the state regulate that same demonstration with those same horrible words in a park? No. Ordinary First Amendment doctrine says you can't regulate speech just because it's offended and degrades people and abuses people. Can't do that. But we couldn't have a university if it didn't do those same things. The Congress of the United States has rules. It says if we're going to debate, we debate in ways that show respect for each other. You can't impugn the motives of a fellow senator. Remember, Elizabeth Warren got censored because she cited a, a statement by Coretta King. Um, uh, in opposing Jeff Sessions for Attorney General, and she got censored by the Senate. Um, those rules are thought necessary for debate, no, no different in a university. So context does matter, but what I'm going to suggest is it matters in terms of the kind of educational judgments uh, one is making. A theory of rights is not a theory of education, and John Dewey would be the first person to, uh, to say that. Okay, so I think, I think now we've centered in on where some of the hardest issues lie, and that's with regard to outside speakers. And as I said, I would argue that, that universities really should open up for students uh, so that they develop the capability of democratic self-governance, the ability to bring in outside speakers, particularly to public spaces on campus, and perhaps to, to expose themselves to viewpoints that are not approved by university administration or by particular faculty members who have decided what's educational and what's not. Um, so Professor Post says, and this is, this is a dispute that's going on right now in the CNN versus Jim Acosta case, is when, so when must the government open up government property for the use of citizens for expressive purposes. And in many cases, in many instances involving government property, there is no affirmative obligation on the part of the government to open that property. That's probably, I mean, in fact, it is almost certainly the rule of, that applies to a White House press conference. You need not open a White House press conference to a pool of reporters, but if you do open that press conference, you may not then, once you've done it, discriminate on the basis of viewpoint. Uh, and so that, that is a clear, uh, clear cut on, in some instances of government property. So the question is, are some spaces on public universities different? Are they more like public streets, parks, and sidewalks in the sense that they have traditionally been used for expressive purposes? They lend themselves to those purposes, and within those spaces, uh, the government should do more. It should only impose reasonable time, place, and manner restrictions according to First Amendment pr principles that look at government, well, they look at the tradition and history of the property, but there's another line of precedent that looks at the government intent with regard to the forum. And I think there are definitely, if you looked at, at most of the public university campuses I've been on, and I've spent my whole career uh, at, on public university campuses, I, I had my whole education except for my Fulbright at Cambridge on public university campuses, and I've spent my whole career on them. And there's almost always a place where by tradition and by history, it's dedicated to expressive purposes. And there, universities really are constrained by First Amendment principles not to do more. Now, I want to take uh, something else that, that Dean Post said. So Dean Post talked about students saying unspeakable things. Well, the devil is really in the details here because what does unspeakable mean? Regulating student speech in public spaces on campus merely because it's offensive to some other set of students, I would argue is, is um, forbidden by existing constitutional, pre uh, uh, constitutional uh, principles. Uh, so there's a long line of cases saying that the government may not regulate speech in public spaces simply because it's offensive. Now, it would be different if it crossed the line into harassment, uh, but harassment is a legal term that is narrower than it's been interpreted on some campuses, and so there's a real distinction between hate speech and harassment. Hate speech cannot be forbidden. Harassment can. Um, how much time do I have left? <laughs> uh, 
Um, and, and so, and so I, have, I have another point I want to make uh, about the campus speech problem. There's another campus speech problem on university campuses as well that I think uh, Dean Post and I both agree on, is that is a problem when legislatures pressure university administrators to muffle or silence research that they don't like or faculty opinions with which they disagree. And so I don't want to uh, leave out a particular campus speech problem that I think is uh, worth further discussion. Very okay. unsettling to do this in five minute interviews, you should know. It's very hard to, <laughs> you have to, to five develop remaining, a thought. Yeah, exactly. Five remaining right, minutes in which to make your additional <laughs> points and uh, whatever concluding remarks you'd like All to right, share. All right, here we go. So, um, uh, of course, uh, as a matter of technical First Amendment law, a public university could have created a designated public forum, and we can discuss when we have more than five minutes what that means, and it could create an actual public forum, um, but it's also the case that they don't have to. And um, what I'm going to submit to you is the decision to do that and the decision to create the shape and purpose of the designated public forum um, has got to be educational because that's the function of the university. Um, when we say that there's doctrine pro prohibiting the state from regulating offensive speech, that's true, but that's regulating speech as if you were leafleting in a park or uh, picketing a funeral in, uh, in a street or um, censoring a magazine. Um, but uh, just starting in the classroom, uh, there are lots of rules that says, you know, I can't speak offensive names to my students in the classroom and they can't speak offensively to each other because you can't educate. The same would be true, let's say, in a dorm room. If you have a student who's act acting in a way that no one can live with and is upsetting all the students around them continuously, that student will be subject to discipline and properly so. And as the authority and the impact of the speech goes out into the public, so, um, so will the um, authority to regulate it until the student is acting, let's say, qua citizen. And the notion of when the student is acting as a citizen versus being subject to the authority of the university, that's a normative judgment which the, which the court makes all the time in terms of the freedom of speech of government employees. Are they speaking as a citizen or as an employee? These are kinds of judgments that are at the root of lot First Amendment law. So when I say uh, unspeakable things, I'm going to speak it now because you're forcing my hand. They were sitting there shouting, yes means no, no means anal. I mean, no means yes, yes means, I can't even say it, forget it, but you get, you get the point. Um, and I mean, you know, it was, it was extremely upsetting. Now, what's the difference between upsetting and harassing? I would say the definition goes to, is it making it impossible to complete the educational mission? Not offense for its own sake, no. It's rather the relationship to what students are there to do, which is to learn, and if they're getting so, um, uh, discombobulated uh, that they can't learn, then it's the university's obligation to, to step in and create an environment in which people can learn. That's the object, that's the goal of a university. And I want to spend my last X seconds um, referring to something you said in your original, which is deference to the university um, and whether it's a good idea or a bad idea. I, I can't even imagine the notion that, and let's just take tenure and you know, what we're going to approve by way of who's getting tenure is a marketplace of ideas. That, um, th that is just, uh, to me, a thought that's unimaginable. It would mean basically first come, first serve, or what? I mean, there's a limited number of tenured slots. On the basis of what are you going to distribute the tenured slot, if not on merit? Merit has nothing to do with a quota of so many liberals and so many conservatives. It has to do with the merit uh, under the professional discipline of the work. And so it's not a marketplace of ideas. And if, the, if, the, if those who know something about the merit of work are not going to make that judgment, who are? Judges are not experts in astrophysics or in sociology or in English. Take your discipline. And um, if judges are going to make those judgments, how are they going to make it? They're going to make it by calling in experts in English or sociology or astrophysics. So you're just deferring it to the experts before a judge versus the experts to a university. Either way, the experts should be making the judgment about who can do the work. And so I, I, I can't see this as anything but the university trying to do 
the best thing it can, making the judgments that it should make. I was once chair of the Academic Freedom Committee at UC Berkeley, where we know something about public fora and these demonstrations. And um, I had a professor from the architecture department come in and complain that his academic freedom was being violated. Why, I asked. He said, well, my work is so paradigm shifting, so fundamental, um, that students should be able to major in me. <laughs> In me. Uh, no. <laughs> so how am I supposed to decide whether this work is so bad? You go to the art, you go to the people in the department and say, how good is this work? You know, do people really have to major in that person? Otherwise, how would you make a judgment like that? It all depends upon the quality of the work and who is qualified to judge that. Thank you. Dean Litsky. Okay. So I'm, I'm going to conclude with, with three points. Uh, the first point is the problem with offensiveness as defined by uh, what someone believes interferes with their learning experience is that it essentially creates a heckler's veto on campus uh, when, when people assert those, those views are offensive to me in a way that uh, makes it unable for, that makes me unable to learn. And we certainly uh, have seen some of that. There was a case at Emory University, uh, they called it the chalkening, where a student chalked, I think it was Trump 2016, on the sidewalk and, and students asserted that was so offensive that it threatened their ability to learn. Um, so, so the concept of offensiveness can be so expansive in the concept of hate speech, which is not a legal concept in and of itself. It's, it is not a legally prohibitable category of speech standing alone unless it overlaps with one of the categories of speech you can prohibit it, like threats, like harassment. Uh, but nonetheless, there's a real danger in uh, heckler's veto, and normally harassment needs to be severe and pervasive in order to truly uh, interfere with learning. Uh, right now, in debates about free speech, one of the things I find most disturbing is uh, people asserting that speech is violence, equating speech as violence as a reason for regulating offensive speech, because if it's offensive, it automatically becomes an act of violence, and I worry about that trend coming onto campuses. Uh, number two, my second point uh, here, is that Professor Post and I actually have a great number of points of agreement. It may not be obvious from this, but we, we have a great number of points of agreement. One is that there are spheres in which deference and a great deal of deference is owed to administrators. One of those is the classroom. One of those is the tenure granting system. But they aren't owed that deference in every space, in part because they don't have as much expertise in the speaker's circle of uh, deciding whether advocating for Trump is, is uh, a valid thing to do or not. Uh, so the degree of deference is not the same in all contexts. In Healy versus James, the case I mentioned earlier, um, Justice Powell said that we understand that campuses are somewhat different. There are special characteristics. There's a line of cases involving schools where you have to regulate according to the special characteristics. But it said that needs to be balanced with giving the widest possible latitude to student speech on campus. And it specifically mentioned the idea of marketplaces of ideas on campus. And finally, I'll conclude by saying a lot of the issues discussed today as First Amendment issues on campus really involve issues of campus culture. These issues include whether students get to invite controversial speakers or not, whether students demand professors be fired over controversial remarks, and whether the heckler's veto is used to shut down dissenting voices on campus. And although we've, we've talked about policy and First Amendment here, I think it's important to, to note as a concluding point that intolerance can work almost as effectively as state censorship. And that is something to be concerned about if you care about free speech on campus. All right. Uh, join me, please, in thanking our debaters. Uh, I have had um, the 
the genuine pleasure of um, listening with one ear and reading with another, the uh, watching in real time as questions from the group popped up in response to things that you all said. Um, it's actually um, particularly enjoyable to see people pile on uh, as someone asks a question and then others read the question and say, yes, please uh, tell us your thoughts on that. Uh, there are some clear winners of a handful of questions that have been submitted that lots of folks in the audience are either repeating um, various forms of in the questions that are submitted and uh, or um, have chimed in that they would like to hear the answer to. Um, uh, a lot of folks in the audience would love to hear from the two of you uh, your views on the right to protest on public university campuses, um, particularly the constitutionality of both free speech zones and hate speech codes on such campuses. Um, maybe uh, you could each take a moment uh, to share your view uh, on this question of the right to protest. Uh, uh, so uh, as I said, it's, it's, it's my view that there should be spheres on, on university campuses and traditionally have been spheres on university campuses where there is some right to protest as long as it does not disrupt the classroom. So in that, in that point of fact, I agree very much with Dean Post that learning in the classrooms is, is the paramount goal, but not the only goal of universities. Uh, but universities are microcosms of society. They're not enclaves apart from the rest of our democracy. On university campuses, all of the same debates play out that play out in the rest of society. And so there, there should be, and in fact usually is, some right to protest uh, uh, on university campuses subject to time, place, and manner restrictions so that classrooms are not disruptive. So I know it's heretical in a law school to uh, object to the notion of the word right. So uh, what I want to say is I, I actually agree, I think, that the function, the mission, of a, of a public university is to teach students how to be citizens in a democracy. That is, they have to be tough, they have to tolerate, learn how to tolerate people who um, disagree, um, they, have to, uh, they have to become autonomous. I think it's also the function of the university to create that in the students so they don't start that way. If they started that way, if they entered as mature citizens, you wouldn't have an educational function. It's to take them from late adolescence into maturity. That's what um, that's what the educational role is of a public university and um, uh, citizens protest. So I think we should allow it and we should permit it to the extent it doesn't shut the university down and prevent it doing the other things that it has to do. Um, hate speech is, uh, to me, um, it really depends on your definition of hate speech. I don't want students in my university going around shouting names at each other. On the other hand, they're going to say a lot of things that a lot of students are not going to like and going to call um, hate speech. They can chalk Trump, uh, you know, Trump 2016 all they want, and that's not hate speech on Endereddy's definition. And, I'll, and you know, they can oppose affirmative action, and they can want religion. I mean, a lot of things that a lot of people classify as hate speech are not. So if I'm going to talk about what hate speech is for purposes of the university, it's going to be those uh, kinds of demeaning and insulting epithets which signify that you're not talking to each other as rational human beings, but you're spewing hatred at each other. And so the function of the university is to take people and to teach them how to deal, deal with disagreement in rational, critical ways. That's our function. And so when they're speaking to each other in ways that show um, I hate you, or like, dislike, and that's all they're doing, you know, emoting rather than um, speaking in ways that are, that we try to strive to educe from them, education, educe from them, um, then we're dealing with a different subject. I was just going to say, I, this is where I think our sharpest point of contrast is drawn. Um, when I was at the University of Florida, there was a person, a seriously misguided person, and I, I should preface this by saying I'm Jewish. So this misguided person uh, walked around campus with a swastika on, and many people on campus called for him to be excluded from campus. And the university, in my opinion, rightly so, did not exclude him because the, property rem remedy, the proper remedy for that in a democracy and on public spaces and campuses is counter speech. So, uh, you know, as I say, this is, this, it is, it is, this example I find particularly hateful, 
Uh, it's particularly disturbing to me, uh, but on the other hand, the property remedy is to counter this person with speech about the solidarity of the campus community against exactly those kinds of values. I'll note that when the Nazis marched in Skokie, it was a huge controversy, but out of that controversy, it went up to the Supreme Court and there was a right to march, but out of that controversy arose a consensus that that was wrong. They ultimately never marched after fighting for the right to do so. And today in Skokie, Illinois, there is a Holocaust Memorial Museum in part because of the counter speech that resulted from the Nazis marching there. Yeah, I think the, the, the Nazis should have been able to march in Skokie, but my own view is you don't get to walk around with a swastika on campus. If the person wants a swastika, they can go off campus and march around the campus. There are a number of questions that have been submitted that focus on um, definitions and deference. So I want to sort of throw them out as a package to you. Um, in particular, uh, uh, there's the question of if a college, if we accept the premise that a college can restrict speech in the name of educational mission of the school, uh, and maybe this is directed to you, uh, Professor Post, who should ultimately define that mission? Uh, should a court find one based on impact and intent? Uh, should it accept the stated mission of the restricting school? Um, is there a generalized notion of what is uh, consistent with learning and what isn't? Um, how do you uh, tackle those questions of definition and deference? Um, well, those are uh, fundamental and excellent questions. Courts always tackle the question of mission whenever they decide what, whether and how a school can regulate speech. So in Tinker, an, uh, a case in the 1960s in the Warren Court, the court said that the function of school, and here they're talking about elementary school, uh, is to create young democratic citizens who can think for themselves. And in the 1970s, the Burger Court um, says the function of schools is to inculcate the values of civilization. So in the one hand, the, the function of a school is to um, instill uh, um, instill values, so the school stands in local parentis. That's the 1970s uh, concept of education that the court has. And in the 1960s, it's the opposite concept of education. The school can't stand in local parentis because the students are citizens, meaning the state isn't their parent. Um, I, uh, whenever a court's going to decide this, it's going to have an implicit concept of education. That uh, The court's going to have whatever concept of education it has. That doesn't prevent a university from having its concept of education. I think one of the things we need to do and haven't done enough about in universities is to think what our fundamental educational mission is. One of the reasons you see universities dissolving into this notion of public fora and rights, and it's as if the university is a stranger to its own lands, is because the university has lost a sense of its mission qua university. And once it does that, then of course it has no relationship to the students other than in very particular environments like a classroom or you know, maybe a, a, you know, a student club or something like that. Uh, I think that's a loss for the university that it becomes uh, simply a, a bit of property or a street. Um, I think that um, we do need to do that thinking. Yeah, I, I guess it's probably obvious from my remarks that I, I question uh, the extent to which a public university with adult students uh, ought to be acting in a paternalistic manner towards those students. I mean, certainly some is required to further the educational mission, but I think uh, the heart of our disagreement partly hinges on how much that should be so. As an aside, I should say, I, I really dislike it, particularly when people, uh, my colleagues call law students kids, because I think it undermines their professional education, but I, I really uh, think it, it's better that, that College is when you break away from some of the things you do in secondary school to let people become adults uh, by treating them as adults. Uh, the, line of, the line of speech cases in the public schools really do give a great deal of deference to administrators, but not complete deference. And that's why in Tinker, when students were wearing black armbands to protest the Vietnam War, they said that kind of passive political speech, which is an important part, passive political speech that doesn't disrupt the school environment uh, must be 
allowed. Curricular speech is different, disruptive speech is different, but passive political speech that's non-disruptive. But they also indicated they're not just going to defer to an administrator's judgment about what's disruptive and not disruptive. So I guess what I would say, my point of agreement is yes, Universities in general, schools in general, need to do a better job of defining educational mission. And courts have, and probably always will, and definitely should defer to a large extent to educational and academic concerns. But as I said in my initial remarks, deference is not ab abdication. You know, this comes up a lot in the affirmative action context in a case like Grutter where, uh, and Fisher, where the question is, should the, should the court defer to uh, the educational mission as defined by the University of Michigan or the University of Texas with regard to how you create an educational environment to accomplish whatever the university wants to accomplish. So that's a very live issue, much more live there, I think, than in the speech context. Yeah. Uh, interestingly, there are also, um, a, there's a thread running through a number of the questions that folks have submitted that I think also taps into the Grutter Gratz um, uh, Fisher line of questioning, um, which is, it, it's not so much a First Amendment question as an uh, just advice from the two of you question That's about, right. uh, advice from the two of you question about how, um, how can diversity of viewpoint be um, amplified within a university setting? Some of, a number of the questioners um, want to have your thoughts on this, particularly in light of the statistics that Larissa shared. Uh, on the question of um, uh, uh, political bias on faculties and in social science, in the social sciences in particular, uh, what are um, the ways that students can um, have diversity of opinion enhanced on a campus? Are student organizations the key to this? Is the university's own commitment to this the key to this? Uh, how how best to achieve that goal of making a university a place? where people um, come to embrace a diversity of viewpoints? I think it's the university's job to ensure um, that students are exposed to all relevant points of view so that they can think for themselves about which one they want. You know, if I teach a class and a certain point of view isn't being expressed, I'll express it um, because it has to have legitimation. It has to be legitimate and people have to consider all the alternatives or you haven't done your job educating them. We were talking before about the difference between indoctrination and education. Um, indoctrination says you have to believe this and you give the one thing. Um, it's no point of a university to indoctrinate anything. The point of the university is to expose and to um, discipline the way in which students evaluate the, the alternatives which are presented to them. Which I, I just wanted to go back to one point you were making before about the heckler's veto. So, I mean, in First Amendment doctrine, we say that the audience can't control the speaker because that would shut unpopular views down. That's the heckler's veto. Um, but in an educational setting, one has a peculiar problem, which is one has to meet students where they are. One has to draw it out of the students where they are. And if you've lost the students, you can't educate them. So it's always, uh, um, uh, to speak about a heckler's veto within an educational setting is a much more complicated problem than it would be in the public sphere the public sphere precisely because one is always straining to figure out who is thinking what and encouraging him to think different places, which is always requiring you as a university or as a professor to, to put yourself in the point of view of the audience and to speak from that point of view and to bring out its imminent uh, different uh, uh, ways of thinking about a problem. Uh, so quickly, I agree. I, I agree that there is a pedagogical obligation of professors to bring out all viewpoints within the classroom, including one's students. I mean, that's the point of education, right? Critical thinking, viewpoints you might never have considered, looking at an issue from all sides, and it's traditionally been especially true of a legal education. Um, one of the other developments that I think that is really great um, in public universities is lecture series designed to bring speakers from very different points of view and model civil discourse where even though the speakers are on very different sides, 
they speak civilly to one another, they find points of agreement, uh, you know, despite their differences. And so, for example, on, on the campus at the University of Missouri, our Kinder Institute for, for Constitutional Democracy really has series designed to do that kind of, of thing. I think that's very important. Uh, and finally, I do think student organizations uh, are an important supplement, allowing students that, that uh, delegating to them some authority to bring in viewpoints that they feel they're not hearing in any other way. Students are sometimes uninformed. They, stu they sometimes make very bad choices. Uh, and, and so, but that's part of citizens in a democracy also are sometimes badly informed and sometimes make poor choices, so. Welcome to democracy. <laughs> uh, there are a number of questions here that focus uh, on the question of student groups, uh, and particularly student groups hosting or failing to host um, various organizations. Um, uh, among the issues that people are interested in hearing your thoughts on are when students or student groups limit speech and the university doesn't prevent this, um, what, uh, what solutions might you have to that um, that issue, and um, when, when student groups limit speech. What, what, what do you mean by that? I don't know what this person, I, I assume that this person means a student group that has a set of rules, of a, a sort of ideological criteria for who they will invite, et cetera, and so forth. They're using their budget only to bring people for a particular um, uh, viewpoint. And um, concomitantly, I think, the question about costs to a university for security at controversial student-invited speakers? Should universities be required to subsidize uh, speech, uh, including speech against their mission, if these run into hundreds of thousands of dollars? Thoughts on these uh, student-invited student speech issues? Okay, so, so two thoughts here. I, I thought the question might be referring in part to students no platforming and drowning out speakers with whom they disagree, which I think is a form of um, well, so protest and counter speech against a speaker with whom you disagree is a is legitimate in a democracy. In fact, it's what the marketplace of ideas assumes we will do when we come in with, into speech into contact with speech with which we, we disagree. But things have happened on campuses, uh, like when Charles Murray spoke at um, Middlebury. Middlebury. Middlebury when Charles Murray spoke at Middlebury, where the, the protest was so disruptive that the speaker could not speak at all, I think students are legitimately subject to discipline for so disrupting the ability of speech on a, on a campus that the speech can't take place at all, rather than counter-protesting. The, the issue of cost of speech, that's, that's really a hard issue. Um, so there are, Cases, uh, there's a host of cases in First Amendment law that say we as a society, to a certain extent, have to subsidize the speech of speakers. So as taxpayers, we have to subsidize some speech we disagree with. Uh, I taught a case this, th I'm not teaching as much as Dean, but I taught a case this week uh, called Schneider from 1939, and they said people have a right to, to protest in public streets, parks, et cetera, even it, or I'm sorry, that, that case says uh, you have a right to handbill, even though the government is saying, well, that might cost some litter, and then we'll have to pick that up, and we might have to have more trash collectors. They said, well, then punish the litterers, but, but even if it's going to impose some cost on us, that's a cost that we as a society are going to have to subsidize. The question is how far? And as a dean now, I'm particularly sensitive to this question because... My budget is not as robust as I want. <laughs> and I personally don't think some speakers add much to political discourse, and so I don't want to have to spend millions for security to bring those speakers uh, to, my, to my campus. On the other hand, the First Amendment may very well require me to do so. Courts have never drawn that line between how much cost is too much uh, but I think that's an issue that's, that's it's already coming up into the courts, and that's going to be an interesting line that they're going to have to draw. 
Is one million too much? Is two million too much? Is three million too much? And as I say, as a cash-strapped dean, I'm very, very sensitive to these issues. Professor Post, I, I'll, um, I'll add that in real time, our questioner did clarify um, that they aren't so much interested in student groups not inviting speakers so much as small groups of students protesting and then not. So it's the um, no platforming question. Right. I, I think Larissa has it uh, exactly right on the no platforming. So if you start with the major premise, which is why do you allow students to use your resources to invite speakers? It has to be because it serves the educational purposes of the institution. And therefore, if they invite a speaker and other students prevent the speaker from serving that educational function, those students are contradicting the purpose of the university and therefore are appropriately subject to um, discipline. Students will invite the speakers they want to invite. And you often get diversity because you have diverse student groups. It's a Thibodean system where the Federalist Society will invite uh, conservatives and the ACS will invite liberals and together you have a, a full spectrum that's the idea it's each student group doesn't have to be diverse it's rather the spectrum of student groups should be diverse in um, in that way the cost of security however is in a closed system and externality um, so the court has had some decisions like Forsyth where they say uh, you, uh, a sheriff can't uh, charge a fee for a speaker in a real public forum uh, based on the cost of security, but that's to the state. If a university, uh, um, if every student group could externalize all the costs, the university would go bankrupt. I was once putting on a conference on religion and the law, and I wanted to invite the pope, and I was in negotiations with the Vatican, be a million dollars, literally a million dollars for security for a two-day visit. Uh, no, sorry, <laughs> I don't have that kind of money. Um, um, but you know, if a student group had done it, would I have been forced to do it? No. So one way to think about this is uh, student groups are using your resources to invite speakers, give them a budget. And they have a, the budget includes security, and they can spend it as they wish. But it has to be allocated. It has to be internalized, the cost of security, because if it's just a negative externality and there's no limits on it, it's an, it's an, it becomes an indefensible situation. There's a lot of interest here um, in a question about um, whether academics could be held professionally accountable for speech made in a private capacity. So for example, a university professor being censured for inflammatory tweets, if those tweets arguably under your uh, rubric undermine the educational or research mission of the university. Uh, what are each of your positions on that? Well, there's two kinds of protections for a professor who does that. The first is academic freedom. And academic freedom uh, says that uh, you have academic freedom, what's called extracurricular speech. That's speech made in your capacity as a citizen, not in your capacity as a professional. And um, for that speech, you can be penalized only if it goes to your competence as a professional. So um, from the point of view of any professor who has academic freedom, uh, you can be, um, uh, you are, uh, the, the university cannot discipline you unless it goes to your competence as a teacher or as a researcher. And that's the question in, in all of these cases. And in most of these cases, it doesn't. Um, from the point of view of First Amendment rights, um, you as a government employee have the right to speak on matters of public concern as a citizen. And there are a lot of cases which talk about the limitations of that right, namely, um, the state gets to balance its interests in being an efficient employer to do that. And these are not on the whole, very speech protective decisions. So the protections that you have under academic freedom are much more robust than the protections you have under First Amendment for speech outside your employment if it causes bad things or harms your employer in any way. I, I would agree with that. Uh, in, the, in the government speech cases where they say you have a right to speak as a citizen unless it's too disruptive and then they balance it and maybe even if it's on a matter of public concern, uh, you, can, you can still be disciplined or fired. Uh, in, specifically in one of those cases called Garcetti, they said academia may be different. Uh, so academia, there may be more deference before you claim that the professor's speech or the academic speech is disruptive. So it's different from other government employees. Uh, and I, I think that is the the right analysis. I think in general, when you're when a professor is is tweeting, particularly when they're expressing political views, there've been some recent controversies. For example, one professor tweet professors. Uh, some of these examples are like professors doing 
stupid things. Uh, but a professor tweeted how glad she was that Barbara Bush was dead and the whole Bush clan. She wished they would follow rather quickly. Um, it's a political view, uh, but there was a lot of outcry over that. And so really in a lot of those cases, uh, universities, what, what happens is uh, the professor should have some deference when they're speaking of the students, and, but they get tremendous public pressure to do something to the faculty member, to fire the faculty member, to, to uh, censor the faculty member. Uh, and so, so a lot of times, again, we talk about culture mattering. In, in the culture in general, uh, there's, there's a desire to, to use social censure to uh, police speech that we don't like. I mean, it's a form of counter speech, right? Is using social censure to tell the person they've gone too far and exceeded the bounds of, of what we consider decent people to say in a democracy. Okay, our time is uh, almost up and there are so many great questions in the queue that I am going to take them with me to dinner and um, get all the answers. <laughs> so I'll report back to everyone about what the answers are to the remaining 25 questions in the queue. Um, but I'm, go I'm going to throw out as a, a sort of la uh, last thoughts question, a uh, question that I think is um, appropriate for these last thoughts. Um, one person asks, um, no matter the results of the debate, no matter which side um, uh, we take, how can students, professors, visitors, and others work together to promote freedom of speech without imposing personal views on others? Uh, we work together by learning respect for each other and by actually being curious about what we have to say to each other. I mean, we're here to learn from each other. That's the point of a university environment is that there are so many different people with so many different points of view that are respect worthy and that we can learn from. That's what we are. We're a learning environment. And if we can be clear about that and actually believe it, um, then we will work together for precisely that purpose. I agree completely with that, and to that I would also add uh, that I believe we need a lot more civic education of students coming up before they get to college and while they're in college. And I, I tweeted this last night, but uh, Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, who, who is very familiar to certain people within this room, uh, just, she is a true visionary hero, and I didn't realize it at the time. Years and years ago, she started campaigning to improve the level of civic education in this country and to bring it back into high schools. And she saw that the lack of civic education threatens our ability to engage in democratic self-governance and ultimately threatens the rule of law. And she was so right. And so to what uh, Dean Post uh, sagely advised, I would add, adding more civic education. Join me in thanking our fantastic debaters. <laughs> all right, we invite you all to uh, join our guests and each other uh, for a reception here in the uh, area uh, just outside these doors. And thank you all for joining us tonight. Well, I did, I converted. So I grew up naturally.